For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm a gynaecologist with a, a special interest in pain and um, particularly in endometriosis associated pain. And so we thought that I would start with just giving a little bit of an introduction from my clinical experience as to why we thought this was an important topic. Um, so classically, what do we think of as the pain that's associated with endometriosis? Well, we tend to think about the three key symptoms of period pain, non-cyclical pain, so pain that's there throughout the month or if you're on hormone treatment, and pain with sex. For some women, we know that you can also experience pain with bowel opening and pain when urinating. And for those who have rarer forms of the disease, such as thoracic and diaphragmatic disease, you might also get some chest pain and some shoulder pain. And that's what you'll read in a textbook of endometriosis. But our clinical experience is somewhat different. And we know that we see patients with all sorts of different types of pain that they've either been told or believe is related to their endometriosis. And we looked at some of our research data collected for separate studies on pain and looked at where women had drawn on body maps their experience of their pain associated with endometriosis. And you can see here we've coloured them in according to how many women um, reported pain in that area. And actually only about 20% of our group of women actually described pain that was localised within their pelvis. So most women with endometriosis are experiencing pain outside of their pelvis, often as far down as their feet or as far up as their head. And what we saw was that the more widespread the pain was, the more depressed women reported being. And this isn't an isolated finding. So this is some data from the US um, looking at people with um, urological pelvic pain. So um, something a bit like bladder pain syndrome, interstitial cystitis. And what they found was that three quarters of their group of patients all experienced pain outside the pelvis. And this was much more likely to occur in women than men. And the more widespread this pain was, again, their quality of life was worse, their sleep was worse, and they described more psychological distress, again, predominantly feeling more depressed rather than more anxious. And we know that other pain conditions are really common in people with endometriosis. So there was one study looking at teenagers with endometriosis and those in their very early 20s and over 50% of those reported pain um, in other areas and other pain conditions. We know that about half of those with endometriosis will describe IBS-like symptoms. Bladder pain syndrome is almost four times more common in women with endometriosis than those without. Lots of women describe vulval pain though we haven't really got very good estimates of how much more common that is. Migraine is probably at least twice as likely as it is in the background population. So that's again over a third of women with endometriosis. Rheumatoid arthritis, probably about one and a half times more likely. Temporomandibular joint dysfunction, so pain in their jaw. And then fibromyalgia, the topic that we're really going to focus on today, is between two and four times more likely if you have endometriosis than the background population. And again, that range depends a little bit on the studies that you're looking at. And this is just some data showing that if you have endometriosis, you're more likely than the background population to develop fibromyalgia or chronic widespread pain, but also the other way around. So those who have fibromyalgia or chronic widespread pain are more likely to subsequently be diagnosed with endometriosis. And so thinking about what may be underlying that relationship. We looked specifically at some genetic data and there were lots of areas where the genes that we know are involved with endometriosis overlapped with other um, genetic relationships that have been investigated. But you can see here that I've circled in red that there was a significant overlap between the genes involved in endometriosis and the genes that have been found to relate to those who have pain all over their body. And we know that the more pain conditions you have, the more likely you are to develop another one. So you can see here, this was a study specifically in women with migraine, but those with migraine without endometriosis were about two and a half times more likely to develop fibromyalgia. But those who had migraine and endometriosis were nearly five times more likely to develop fibromyalgia. 
And often people with fibromyalgia will also describe fatigue. And you can see that the combination of migraine and endometriosis meant nearly 16 times more likely to develop chronic fatigue syndrome, as opposed to just four times more likely if you had migraine alone. And so apart from everything that we've just talked about, why does this matter? Well, you can see that there's a real impact on quality of life, sleep and psychological well-being if you have multiple pain conditions. As a gynaecologist, I really worry about people having unnecessary repeated surgeries. So if your pain persists, but actually your pain in your pelvis is part of a, a set of other pain symptoms, but you still have pain in your pelvis, you may well go on to have another um, surgical procedure with the aim of at least treating that bit of the pain without thinking about the other symptoms. And there's some really good data coming out of a variety of different centers suggesting that if we treat one pain without doing anything to any of the other pains, we might improve those other pains. So if you have endometriosis and fibromyalgia and we treat the endometriosis, then your fibromyalgia symptoms may improve. On the other hand, if we treat your fibromyalgia, your endometriosis symptoms might improve. So thinking about um, your whole body and your whole experience rather than focusing on just one area, I hope would be really beneficial. And I'm really lucky in Oxford that if I see someone with symptoms that suggest to me fibromyalgia, then I can refer them on to a rheumatologist. And the person I often refer on to is Anushka to give us her um, opinion and think about a treatment plan that will be coordinated between all of us. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Anushka and let her um, talk to you in much more detail about fibromyalgia. Thank you, Katie. Um, so we thought that um, now that Katie's given a really clear overview of why this link between endometriosis and fibromyalgia is so important and relevant, that I would uh, go on to talk uh, about things maybe from the, the other perspective to begin with in terms of just giving a bit of an overview about fibromyalgia, what we know about it, and also thinking a little bit about what we don't know as well and where, where we need to go moving forwards. So, um, so this um, figure just illustrates how fibromyalgia, whilst being um, characterized by generalized widespread uh, musculoskeletal pain, um, particularly associated with chronic fatigue and sleep disturbance, it is also a condition that can and often does affect almost any part of the body. Um, and as Katie has already described, there are a number of um, overlapping features between different pain conditions. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to go back. Sorry about that. Um, but just really to, to illustrate that there's a number of other symptoms that can be associated with it too. Let me see if I can get it to go forwards. There we go. Um, so it's a common condition um, with an overall worldwide prevalence of 2.7%. Um, the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that actually there seems to be quite a bit of variation in the, in the point estimates between different countries. But actually, I have a theory that this is more to do with the different ways that we are capturing and assessing fibromyalgia rather than an actual difference in, in the frequency of it occurring in different parts of the world. Um, and I will mention just briefly how things have evolved in terms of diagnosing it. But one of the problems here is that we, we don't have any clear diagnostic tests or biomarkers at present. So it is currently a clinical diagnosis. Um, so it has a clear female preponderance. Um, and interestingly, when you look at the epidemiology data, the peak age is between 50 and 60 years of age. But actually, in reality, um, when we go, come to looking at, at the kind of people we see in our clinics, they're usually much younger, often in their 20s and 30s at the time of presentation. It has a huge effect on people's quality of life. Um, and we know that patients who have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia have healthcare costs that are three times that of people who don't have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. And that's both through consultations, both in primary and secondary care, as well as um, the cost of treatments and associated investigations, which I'll just come on to a little later too. It has a huge impact on work ability. Um, and there was one particular study that um, identified that 
in 25% of patients um, they diagnosed with fibromyalgia, they were unable to work within five years of symptom onset. And given there's often a huge delay between developing symptoms and actually um, receiving a diagnosis, this has an absolutely staggering effect. There's also a number of long-term effects that, to be fair, are not fully understood, but are certainly beyond the direct effects of pain itself, um, with an increased risk of dementia and increased mortality, which again is not completely clear as to why. And as I mentioned, there are some questions still about how we best diagnose fibromyalgia, and also um, some questions remaining about how we're best treating fibromyalgia, but perhaps a little more positivity there in terms of the data that we do have to hand on that front. So in terms of the diagnosis, um, this is how it was diagnosed um, un until relatively recently. Um, there were a series of tender points that were evaluated. You had to apply a certain amount of pressure and see whether those spots were tender or not. And if you had 11 out of these 18 areas significantly tender, that would then give um, a diagnostic label of fibromyalgia. But over time, we recognised that actually this was a, a pretty rubbish way of assessing and diagnosing fibromyalgia. There's quite a lot of variability in terms of how hard people were pressing when they were doing these tender point counts. People felt that it was quite a specialist um, assessment. And so uh, primary care physicians, for example, weren't comfortable at using that approach. And also it doesn't really um, include any of those other features um, that are so integral to the condition. So we've moved on. Um, there's been quite a few versions of the diagnostic criteria, but these 2016 ones are the ones that are mainly in use. So if we start over on the left hand side, the first part is actually trying to capture which areas of the body um, are painful. So rather than looking for tenderness, we're trying to assess which bits of the body are causing pain. And for um, a diagnostic uh, label of fibromyalgia, we also need to ensure that not only are there um, enough areas that are causing pain, but that they are um, in a widespread fashion. So it isn't that you have, say, for example, a lot of pain around your right upper limb, but that it is spreading over several different regions. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the new version of the diagnostic criteria also includes a number of other non-pain criteria. So capturing things like fatigue, um, problems with memory, and also of note, um, pain or cramps in the abdomen, for example. And so we can generate a score based on this assessment that can help us uh, to, to make a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. So in terms of treatment, there's um, a lot more evidence base available, thankfully. And so these are the ULAR guidelines um, developed by the European group um, against uh, rheumatic conditions. Um, and these were published in 2017 and were essentially um, base, uh, devised based on reviewing a number of uh, different systematic reviews available for the various treatment options available. The main take home message I would say from this is actually that the only um, therapy based uh, recommendation in the guideline that had very strong level of evidence and also a reasonably good effect size um, was actually exercise. Interestingly, they weren't able to pick out any particular forms of exercise that were most effective. So it could include strengthening as well as cardiovascular forms of exercise, for example. But just to give a more general overview, essentially, um, so starting on the left-hand side with the yellow boxes, um, one of the important messages emphasized by the guidance was to try and reach a diagnosis uh, sooner rather than later. So this is all about um, having a high index of suspicion um, and referring on uh, for specialist assessment if needed. Once the diagnosis has been made, it's really important that patients are informed about the condition. And because of this uh, strong level of evidence for physical therapy, activity-based treatments, that's always the starting point for each and every patient. However, for those patients in whom this is insufficient, we then move on to diversify the different types of treatment options. So um, Katie was mentioning the association um, with uh, mood. Um, and so that's one component that we always need to assess and be mindful of and address as specifically as we can. So psychological therapies that are relevant here include things like cognitive behavioral therapy, and most um, recently, there's been a lot of focus on using acceptance and commitment therapy. In those in whom um, there is severe 
pain or um, indeed sleep disturbance, there are specific um, medications that can be tried. I've put the, um, a couple of these in brackets, the pregabalin and the tramadol, because there's now um, more up-to-date um, guidance from NICE um, suggesting that these agents should um, be avoided. And that's based on the fact that at a group level, um, these are generally more likely and more prone to cause more in the way of side effects than actually improving symptoms. But I would say that's not to say that in certain individuals it can be incredibly helpful. And then for those in whom um, they do already have severe disability, their uh, ability to work, for example, is impaired, then we embark on multimodal rehabilitation. And again, we're really lucky in Oxford, we have um, a pain management program, which is led by very experienced physiotherapists using psychologically informed techniques to help patients manage their symptoms. Um, so what you'll notice from all those um, suggested therapeutic measures is that there are actually things that can be done as an outpatient. They can be done in the community. There's no need to admit people to hospital to um, receive these therapies. So we were really surprised when we undertook a study looking at um, hospital admissions in England on the National Health Service for fibromyalgia. I wasn't really expecting to see any, but actually over a four year study period, we saw over 24,000 hospital admissions taking place. And when we looked in a little more detail, what was even more alarming was that almost half of those admissions included um, an intravenous infusion. Again, this isn't something that is currently um, evidence based in any way. All the medications are oral therapies and a lot of um, invasive therapeutic procedures were being undertaken. And the worry there is that we're unnecessarily putting people at risk. So why might this be happening? Why is there this discord? Well, my theory is that actually, even though we've revised our diagnostic criteria, ultimately, this is a really heterogeneous condition. And there, you know, no two patients are the same. There's so many different factors contributing to the presentation. And so what happens is if we're trying to treat everybody in a similar fashion, naturally, there are going to be uh, times when we're not able to help people as much as we'd like to with our first line treatments and indeed second and third line treatments too. And so in an ideal world, we would be able to look at the underlying mechanisms and target those directly. But unfortunately, thing, pain is, is pretty complicated um, and there are a number of mechanisms at play. And one of them in particular, which we, we know is uh, relevant in fibromyalgia, is this thing called the descending pain modulatory system. And so this is where the brain is able to assert a top down control on pain signals as they are coming in um, from the outside. And so it's almost as though you have a volume control button essentially in the brain stem here on the bottom right of the diagram. And that can serve to amplify the pain or facilitate pain, or it can dampen it down or inhibit it. And in fibromyalgia, there's various neuroimaging studies that we now have um, available to us that have demonstrated that actually in people living with fibromyalgia, unfortunately, the volume control has been turned way up and it's tending towards this facilitatory or amplification um, state. What's interesting is that on the inhibitory side, that does seem to be less effective, although the one exception here is that of opioids. And what we see here is that the uh, naturally occurring opioids that we have seem to be higher than people without chronic pain. And we think that this may be because these uh, transmitters are less effective um, than in normal people. And it's like the body is, and the brain is trying to overcompensate. And this may be why that we see people not responding as well as we would have expected to opioid treatments, such as the tramadol that I mentioned earlier. So in an ideal world, we'd be able to marry up the specific neurotransmitter or mechanistic problem with a specific treatment. Of course, it's not that straightforward for several reasons, but also the fact that we mustn't forget that actually pain not only is driven by top down and controlled by top down mechanisms, but also by uh, signaling and processes coming in from the periphery. So this bottom up, bottom up um, type mechanism. And there's increasing recognition in the fibromyalgia field now that actually there are other things other than brain signaling pathways that are happening out in, in the, what we call the peripheral nervous system, where signals are being sent in from, from skin areas and muscles out in the periphery um, that may well be relevant and ultimately um, lead to, to potentially novel treatments.
So with that, I will finish there as food for thought and thank you all for your attention. Um, and we are very happy to take questions. Thank you, Anishka. Thank you, Katie. Um, so the first question is, if you're waiting for a referral to rheumatology, is having endometriosis as well as other chronic conditions a good reason to speed up referral to rheumatology and to be given a priority? This, uh, this is a great question. I, I can give you the theoretical answer and I can give you the real answer. So from the data that Katie showed, obviously she showed that if you've already got uh, more than one chronic pain condition, you're more likely to then go on and develop other um, chronic conditions. And so in theory, um, it would be great if we could profile patients in that way and use that to triage them. Unfortunately, there's a number of reasons at the moment, um, certainly in our service, that we're, we're not able to, to really tailor the timeliness of our assessments um, using those indicators. Um, one is that uh, we're not often given that information. Um, but what I will say is that uh, we're now using uh, more digital techniques to try and get more comprehensive uh, information directly from patients at the point of referral. So we're not, and that's something we've trialed in our fibromyalgia clinic specifically, so not having to rely on GPs to provide the relevant data. Um, so it's possible that going forwards, we will be able to do that. And that is something that we're working towards. But unfortunately, at the moment, that isn't the case. Can rheumatoid factor be raised with either endometriosis or fibromyalgia? This is a great question. Um, so the answer is yes, it can. But the question is whether that rheumatoid factor is relevant or not. So rheumatoid factor is a really non-specific marker. It's another, rheumatologists are great at having these tests that are not diagnostic. It is not specific or sensitive enough for us to base a diagnosis on. So when we see a positive rheumatoid factor, we'll be looking to see how high it is. Um, and also very much in the context of the other features. So you can have a rheumatoid factor with no other diagnoses or various other diagnoses, but it may not be relevant clinically. So that is uh, based on the, your clinical assessment. So shall I go on to the next yeah. question on the list? Um, so that if someone has fibromyalgia and both their daughters have endometriosis, can this be linked? And what are the chances of my daughters getting fibromyalgia? So I guess we slightly covered that at the beginning, which is to say that absolutely there is an overlap. Exactly what the mechanisms are that is causing that overlap, I don't think we fully understand. But there certainly seems to be an overlap with the genes that predispose to both of these conditions. But all of the things that Anushka was talking about in terms of pain modulation, we also see in the context of endometriosis associated pain, in the context of IBS, um, vulval pain, all of those things. So, you know, the descending and the ascending pathways are important in all of these chronic pain conditions. So exactly what has caused that overlap, I'm not sure we can fully say at this stage, other than that it's likely to be multiple different things rather than just one. Um, and as far as what are your chances of your daughters getting fibromyalgia when they have endometriosis, the data at the moment would say two to four times more likely than someone in the background population. Um, but I don't know how helpful that is at this stage. And are endometriosis and fibromyalgia linked was the next question, which I guess we've already slightly addressed. addressed. Um, the fourth question is someone who has had surgery has a pain score of 50. They feel they're allergic to pain and not even oxycodone is enough to get it under control. Is this normal for the fibro endo mix? And Nishka, do you want to say something more about the analgesics and then maybe I'll talk yeah. about the operative pain? Yeah, great. Um, so I guess um, that feeds a little bit into what I was mentioning earlier about the opioids and how the, the latest data really shows that actually it, they aren't effective um, in these uh, chronic primary pain conditions, which would include um, fibromyalgia. Um, and so... I think, would that be expected? I suppose that potentially would be. Um, in an ideal world, I guess, and I think maybe this was something that was a follow-on question 
in terms of how you address it, it might be thinking about it in the pre-operative stage, and there may be things that can be be done um, there. Um, I guess, Katie, you're better <laughs> positioned to talk about stuff that's surgical um, and around that. Yeah, and I think it's not something, so when we think about patients coming in to have an operation, we think about all their risks in terms of anaesthetic risks and surgical risks. So we think about, you know, do they have heart disease or diabetes that's going to make it more risky to put them to sleep? Have they had lots of surgeries in the past, so they might have lots of scars inside their tummy that makes the actual surgical procedure more risky. But I don't think we think so much about what will make their recovery period worse and I think that's something that we're increasingly trying to focus on within our service and think about actually how much education do we need to give people before they come to an operation you know how much should you be mobilizing and getting out of bed straight after your operation some people will do lots some people will do nothing and there's probably a happy medium how much pain should you expect and um as Anishka's already mentioned, we know that you're more sensitive to pain if you have some of these chronic pain conditions. And we certainly see that patients with a background of chronic pain can often experience much more pain after their operation than someone who otherwise was pain free. And I think trying to think about how we manage that is going to be really important. There's quite a lot of work going on in the States about this because of the opioid crisis that's really big there. They've been trying to think about ways of not giving patients opioids post-operatively. So giving things like gabapentin before operations and seeing whether that reduces the amount of pain you have afterwards. So I hope over the next few years, we'll start to see some real positive changes coming out of that. But I think feeling like you have more pain than your friend had after your operation when you have endometriosis and fibromyalgia and maybe they had a similar surgery for an unrelated cyst, for example. I think that is completely normal. It's what we see. Um, but being normal doesn't necessarily mean it's all right. And I think we need to find better ways of dealing with that. Uh, and that sort of addresses the five, the next couple of bits to that. What's the best long term pain management approach for endo and fibro together? I mean, <laughs> I guess my feeling is probably slightly different from your average endometriosis clinic because we do so much more of the pain side of things and we work really closely with teams like Kanishka's and um, the pain management team. I think that we should be approaching both of them together and thinking about pain management really early rather than that really long diagnostic delay for endometriosis and similarly long diagnostic delay for fibromyalgia. I think if we start thinking about it much earlier, hopefully we'll get on top of some of these changes more quickly. We certainly know that some patients with fibromyalgia will feel better on hormone therapy, for example, others will feel worse. So thinking about does our treatment for endometriosis worsen or improve your fibromyalgia might be an important consideration. And I think that the pain management approaches that you think about Anushka much more than we do as gynecologists are likely to be really beneficial for our patients with endometriosis associated pain too. Absolutely, so a, a com yeah, no, a combined approach. Although to be fair, like you say, I think you probably are a bit unusual, but you do already adopt a very sort of multimodal type approach, not relying purely on you know a single medication or a single therapy. I think the key here is to really um, try and tailor the treatment so that we are responding to what we're seeing in our patients. You know, what is causing the most distress, and how can we help with that? And then over time, hopefully those, they sort of work together and enhance each other's effectiveness as well. And I think there's real benefit in thinking if you've had surgery and if you had surgery, your pain got better and four or five years later it's recurred, that's quite different from if you have surgery and you never really got much better and the pain's continuing to build up. And I think in those cases, I think sort of stepping back and thinking about some of the more pain management approaches before diving into a further surgical procedure. I'm not sure we always think so broadly about those side of things. And I hope that not saying that surgery is wrong, but thinking about when we time our next surgical procedure have tried to damp down as much of that background level of pain, partly so you see more benefit from the surgery, but also so you don't get more of that post-operative pain. Um, I'm back. Can you hear me? Hey, oh my gosh. Back. I'll hand back over to you for question asking. <laughs>
how difficult is it to diagnose fibromyalgia in line with endometriosis? Is there treatment available and how do I get my GP surgery to take me seriously? I mean, I think that's a really good question. I mean, I guess from the endometriosis point of view, I think that if you go and see a gynecologist and you only have pelvic pain, then we will think about it in the context of endometriosis. But I think it's really important to tell people that there is more to this than just your pelvis. So if your shoulders ache all the time and so do your wrists and your hands and your ankles are sore, then tell people rather than feeling like, oh, it's just another complaint and I'll keep it hidden away. Um, Anushka, I don't know if you want to say something about if there's any diagnostic complexity with adding endo into the mix. Uh, not from my perspective, to be honest, I'm, I uh, almost expect it, um, e either someone to have that or some or irritable bowel is the other one that's that's very common. And obviously you can just have fibromyalgia without any other um, ongoing issues. Um, but very often, I would say more often than not, there is something else there in the background too. So whether that's chronic migraine, irritable bowel or endometriosis. So I don't think, but that's sort of, I'm only seeing those people who have managed to get through into secondary care and have already you know been referred by their GPs um so I can speak to that sort of group in the sense that it doesn't it doesn't actually make it any different um in terms of making that diagnosis I think it's really hard trying to um sort of get to that point sometimes if there's this feeling of not being believed and and the other thing that's really hard is that actually you know it's not obvious, I don't think, that feeling really tired all the time, having trouble with your sleep and difficulty remembering certain things or finding the right words at certain times, and your abdominal pain is linked. You know, I don't think that's necessarily intuitive. But as you say, if someone has sort of managed to, to make that link, it's just really important to stress that it's not just a localised pain that they're experiencing um, and, and to emphasise all those other features too. Yeah, and I mean, as far as how to take get your GP to take this seriously, I mean, I think there is much more awareness of these conditions, both endometriosis and fibromyalgia, and also awareness that there are things that we can do for them now. Um, so I think GPs are more likely to refer you in because they know that there are things we can do. I think GPs are massively overwhelmed at the moment, so I'm not sure I can answer how to navigate actually getting to the point of being able to speak to a GP but if you do get to be able to speak to a GP or put in a um, e-consult request or however your um, G pra GP practice works I think laying out your symptoms and the impact on your quality of life and your function and your ability to work most people would see that and think that that was a reasonable um, reason for a referral either to gynaecology or to rheumatology. And even just saying, you know, I'm, I'm concerned this could also be fibromyalgia. And we know from our audit data that half of the referrals we receive from our GP colleagues are to address that question. The other half are people who've already been diagnosed and who want further input for management. So, you know, we see those sorts of scenarios all the time. So that's a perfectly reasonable question to put to them. Okay. Um, my next question is more about endometriosis. So um, can endometriosis grow back um, after a full hysterectomy um, um, as the person has had a hysterectomy and has been told that it's endometriosis again? So that's a good question. Um, and I'm not sure that we fully know the answer to that. So the natural history of endometriosis, what happens to it if we do nothing, we still have it fully um, elucidated. If you had a hysterectomy and your ovaries were left behind, then you still have the driver for the endometriosis. And often the endometriosis isn't in the womb itself, the bit that's been cut out, it's in the lining tissue of the pelvis or the bowel wall, for example. So if you still have ovaries and you've not been on hormonal suppression, then absolutely endometriosis can grow back. On the other hand, if you've had your ovaries removed, it's relatively unlikely that endometriosis would grow back. And in our clinical experience, if you had your hysterectomy and your pain never got any better, there's a high chance there are other factors involved as well as just the endometriosis. So what we really commonly see is that women with endometriosis associated pain will have all the other factors that women with pelvic pain without endometriosis have. So things like dysfunction of the nervous system, like Anishka's already mentioned, 
but also we see a lot of women, about 90% of the women in our pelvic pain clinics have some form of musculoskeletal dysfunction. So that's either abdominal wall muscles, lower back muscles, or very commonly pelvic floor and hip muscles. And that can generate huge amounts of pain. And so if your pain really hasn't changed at all post hysterectomy, I'd suggest getting a, a kind of fresh look rather than thinking endometriosis again, stepping back, taking the whole story, thinking what makes my pain much worse? Is it difficult to wee? Am I often constipated? Um, have I had an injury to my foot or my ankle or my back? Those kind of things and trying to sort of piece it together in that way. Is fibromyalgia um, often misdiagnosed as vulvodynia or vice versa? And how do they differ? And or what are their key differences? Can you have both? Katie? <laughs> well, you can definitely, you can definitely have, have both. both. Yeah. yeah. Um, they are very different in that vulvodynia is very localized pain from the vulva and uh, tends to be either provoked or unprovoked. So uh, your classic provoked vulval pain is either with sex, with putting tampons in, riding a bike, tight clothes, tight underwear. That's sort of your provoked vulval pain and your unprovoked can be just the pain that arises at any time. If you have the same type of pain, but also with pain widespread throughout your body, then I guess that's more of a fibromyalgia type picture, but you know, the vulva isn't an area that's classically thought of as a, a tender area um, for fibromyalgia. So I would say even if you have fibromyalgia diagnosed, if you also have very specific, particularly provoked vulval pain, then I would be thinking about making sure you see either a dermatologist or a gynecolo gynecologist with an interest in vulval pain, because there are some specific treatments that we can do for vulvodynia. Thank you. Um, so two years after a hysterectomy, someone, someone was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and four years later diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Is it possible to know which condition causes which symptom and the link between all conditions? So this can be really tricky, actually, in all honesty. Um, there is a link, um, as we've already described. Um, and as we've also said, you know, things definitely coexist. And so, for example, distinguishing between pain from active rheumatoid arthritis, which is a, a, an inflammatory process div driven by the immune system um, and uh, flaring fibromyalgia is really hard. Um, so, again, a little bit sort of like what Katie was saying earlier, often the best thing is just to take a step back each time not make any assumptions about what is causing what and kind of start again and so there are other ways that we can make those assessments and that might be a scenario where we uh, look to using more sensitive um, tests such as ultrasound in joints to look and see is there any active inflammation within the joints and that would be more in keeping with the rheumatoid being active causing the symptoms but because they can coexist it's really hard and actually I think being aware of them together and treating them uh, in parallel is actually the most productive way of, of addressing uh, that element. And I think one of the things that people find really challenging when they have chronic pain is not being able to say, oh, it was that that caused it and trying to sort of take, well, wh where am I now and what are the problems now and what can I do to address it rather than keeping on looking back and thinking, well, was it that first and was this mismanaged? And if I'd done that, would it have made a difference and um, sometimes that's part of the psychological approaches we take sometimes people want to have some counseling to work through things they found challenging in the past uh, other times it can be enough to just think okay this is where I'm going to work now but I think people often find chronic pain what they describe as sort of socially meaningless because there's nothing they can show to people they don't have an arm in a plaster cast or um, a nasty rash or something that makes sense to people they look normal yet they're suffering so much and I think it can feel really challenging to explain it to everybody and to show why you're having to make all the adjustments you do to your life. Definitely. Um, my next question is can endometriosis um, or fibromyalgia um, or both um, manifest both together manifest in flu-like symptoms? 
Um, so this person has endometriosis and it has been suggested they have fibromyalgia too. And when pelvic pain flares up, they get flu-like symptoms as though they're coming down with something that which doesn't actually come. Yeah, so this is something that I see quite a lot in um, clinic as a way of describing that sort of generalised, just being completely overcome by this feeling that you can't continue and do anything. You just all you can do is go to bed and a bit like a sort of coming down with a flu like illness, but it's just really prolonged and it, it doesn't sort of settle um very quickly so um that's just from my sort of clinical experience um but i would say definitely that um flares of, of say the fibromyalgia aspect um can certainly present in that manner where it's just so complete body and, and all encompassing and i think as far as endometriosis goes i think we tend historically to have been quite blinkered and we think, oh, endometriosis is hormone driven, it flares with your period, or it flares when you have sex, and that's mechanical, and sort of think like that, rather than sort of thinking about all the other things that are going on. And I think if we talk to women with endometriosis, even if their pain is really localized in their pelvis, there's lots of other things that cause flares. And there's lots of other symptoms that often go with those flares. So that massive fatigue, aching joints, when you don't normally have joint pain, that sort of feeling like you have a low grade temperature, even if you don't actually, they're all things that people describe in the context of a flare. And I think we don't really understand about low grade inflammation and those kind of things at the moment. And I hope that there'll be some work that comes out over the next five to 10 years as we start to realize the overlap between chronic pain conditions and start to think about what we know about arthritis or fibromyalgia or those type of conditions but it is certainly something that I hear clinically a lot as well. Thank you. Um, is it possible for endometriosis to come after an emergency c-section? So someone is experiencing headaches um, from the left side of their head and shooting chronic pains and their periods are also heavy and a lot of pain sensitivity. Um, does this sound like um, endometriosis um, and if so besides medication how would they solve the problem? So that's a really good question and one of the problems with endometriosis is that the amount of disease you have if we look in your pelvis doesn't relate to the amount of symptoms you have and so there are some women who have really widespread endometriosis but have no pain at all and there's other people who have really mild endometriosis if we're just describing how many spots of the disease we can see but who have really marked symptoms and one of the things that we don't understand is what makes you transition from having no pain to having pain and for some people they will describe that it's a very gradual build up start your periods they're painful over time it becomes more and more painful and you end up with pain all the time and for other people it just comes on from nowhere and then when you have a look you find endometriosis but we don't know whether that endometriosis was there and silent for years before so it could be that you had endometriosis all along and something about the experience of the cesarean section the stress of the experience the sleep deprivation the alteration of how your muscles function all of those kind of things we know there's so many changes involved in pregnancy and also in complicated deliveries that maybe those are the factors that kind of stopped that damping down mechanism and means that you now feel the pain from it on the other hand it could be completely unrelated and there may be no endometriosis there or you may still have silent endometriosis and there's a whole load of other mechanisms that might be generating pain and certainly um, a reasonable proportion of the women we see will describe their pain either starting or getting worse after pregnancies and I'm not sure how much of that is really due to endometriosis having developed from new and more to do with all the other changes that happen to your body and in your life when you've had a baby. Thank you, Katie. Um, so this is a question from someone um, who was diagnosed with fibromyalgia in 2020 after their diagnosis um, of endometriosis the previous year. So they've been told that surgery trauma can be a trigger for fibromyalgia and Lee um, believes theirs may have been um, triggered by the endometriosis. Um, having, they're going to be having a hysterectomy, which is obviously another intense surgery. Um, they want to know will their fibromyalgia symptoms 
worsen again or will they diminish due to hopefully removing a lot of the endometriosis? That's a, a very drift, difficult <laughs> question to answer, to be honest with you. Um, I don't think we really have enough data to, to really call it one way or another. Um, I can see both sides of the argument, um, but certainly I think um, having, having a major surgery can obviously be a trigger for flaring features of fibromyalgia. So I guess that, that would probably be more my concern uh, to try and address that although as we mentioned we don't really have good quality data to guide us on that either um, but just to give an example in the in the context of other types of surgery for example knee replacement surgery there are some small studies suggesting that um, making sure um, that other factors are optimized before the operation so sort of sleep disturbance um, even agents um, such as uh, duloxetine, for example, have been trialed in the, in the preoperative phase as being potentially beneficial. Although I'm not saying that that's you know, what we'd be recommending here, but those are the sorts of things that we might be thinking about to really optimize all, all the factors um, at play. Um, but I think, I think it's hard, hard to say at the moment um, with the level of data that we've, we've got. Yeah, it's a bit of a holy grail, isn't it, to be able to say, oh, I can predict you will get better or you will get worse. And therefore, we know that this is the right treatment for you. Certainly, our clinical practice is to aim to do non-surgical approaches until we've addressed everything else that it is possible for us to address and then do the surgery. Um, but obviously, that's not always possible. And, you know, there may be reasons why hormonal suppression doesn't feel like the right thing to do at this point in time. But... Um, yeah, if there are other ways of thinking about the other sides of the pain before having the operation, then yeah, that's usually what we would suggest. But as Anushka says, we don't have good evidence to base that on. Thank you. Um, is it possible for COVID-19, for the COVID-19 vaccine to bring on fibromyalgia in patients already diagnosed with endometriosis? So this is a really obviously topical question and really interesting. Um, and in actual fact, so I, I was sort of anticipating that we would see um, an increase in our referrals um, with everyone being vaccinated. Um, but I'm not sure um, what your experience is, Katie, but from what I've seen so far, we haven't seen that, um, that splurge. We haven't seen that peak. Um, we, what I have seen a little bit of is people... Um, in whom, say, they already had pre-existing symptoms suggestive of, of a chronic pain condition or fibromyalgia, um, who then received vaccination, that it could certainly trigger a flare. But that's true in many conditions. You know, we're seeing that in our, our patients with inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid um, as well. Um, but de novo, uh, actually, um, I don't think I've seen a case no, and I mean, we haven't seen the rates of long COVID we thought we would see mm. in patients with endometriosis. We thought that, you know, lots of the risk factors were similar and therefore they might be a group that would be particularly vulnerable to that. And I can only think of a very small number of our patients who've had long COVID. And we are hearing anecdotally that people's menstrual cycles are disrupted after the COVID vaccine. But actually what we were seeing was before vaccination, lots of people's cycles had changed in that sort of nine months of COVID before vaccines. And we think that that's partly to do with stress. It was to do with availability of medications, change in lifestyle. Um, so yeah, I don't think we've seen good evidence that the COVID vaccine does anything to reproductive function or endometriosis per se, but the stress of the pandemic experience has certainly impacted on pain and um, periods. Thank you, Bo. Um, so you might have touched on this actually already, so apologies if you have. Um, but I feel it's been a constant theme actually. So can fibromyalgia develop due to being in constant chronic pain for so long with endometriosis? Um, Yes, it's actually an interesting one. Um, and our thinking originally was that um, pain will start off in a more localised fashion 
And then gradually over time, as you say, as you've been exposed to the pain, it then becomes broader and wider and affects more of the body. Um, but actually what research is showing now is that there's so many factors involved in that generalized pain, um, including sort of your vulnerability to developing a generalized pain condition before you develop, say, the endometriosis anyway. And it's probably more down to those vulnerability factors than actually the persistent pain necessarily. Um, obviously, as we keep saying, that it's everything together. But it, what I think we're moving away from now, so for example, in our rheumatology clinics, when we had patients diagnosed with rheumatoid, we would often assume that it would only be the people who had ongoing pain for many, many years, we would then develop the secondary fibromyalgia. But what we're seeing now looking at our early um, cohort data and people who have just recently been diagnosed with rheumatoid, that actually, you know, there's still up to 20% of those patients who, who have fibromyalgia features from the beginning. So we're much more alert to that and aware of that even earlier on in, in the course of time. And as I said at the beginning, you know, there's one study in adolescence and very young women oh, thank you. saying um, 50%, oh. sorry, saying over 50% have other pain conditions. And they're the ones who really haven't had the endometriosis symptoms for very long. So there must be at least some patients in whom it just develops straight away rather than with repeated insults. Okay, great. Um, a little... Um... I've got just got one last question and um, and it's in two parts. So it does um, endometriosis and fibromyalgia cause high CRP levels and ESR levels, or could this even be from the endometriosis alone or other conditions? The second part is which other autoimmune conditions are linked with these dual so conditions? So maybe, shall I, shall I repeat the first part again? I got the first part. Mm -hmm. um, so okay. ESR and CRP are certainly not things that we expect to see in the context of endometriosis. So if we do investigations and we find high levels of those, we would not blame that on just having endometriosis and we would go and look for other things. Other inflammatory markers like CA125, for example, we do know can go up um, with endometriosis, but it's not a diagnostic test by any means, and certainly ESR and CRP we would not consider to be endometriosis as the problem. Anushka, you're much um, better at inflammatory yeah. markers in rheumatology than we are. Um, so, uh, so similarly uh, for fibromyalgia, we wouldn't be expecting to see raised levels of inflammatory markers, either the um, ESR or the CRP, so that wouldn't be something that we would attribute um, to fibro and just like Katie said we'd be hunting for other drivers um, although uh, there are situations that you know, not that infrequently where we don't find the driver um, and often when we look back over time actually those are markers that have been persistently raised um, and what we know from experience and, and from various studies is that if you if nothing has emerged over over a period of time, it's very unlikely that anything new is going to emerge as a driver. And that may just be that individual's sort of baseline level. Um, I've forgotten what the next bit was now. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Was that yeah, it? I should have just done it once <laughs> at a time. Um, so um, And can endometriosis affect skin or bring an, up any skin conditions? So it's kind of like a three-part question. I'm sorry. That's, it seems okay, like so, different parts. And so it was a bit about which other autoimmune conditions are yeah. linked um, with these conditions. Um, so from the sort of fibromyalgia perspective, um, there, there are some data, uh, very early data, um, suggesting from an, uh, animal studies predominantly suggesting that there may be a sort of autoimmune element. Um, but I think it's important to emphasize that these really are preliminary data. They've not been validated uh, separately and they've not been demonstrated in uh, sort of human um, studies. Uh, and so 
I think we're very far away from labeling fibromyalgia as one of a number of autoimmune conditions that are therefore linked together, if that makes sense. Um, it, my guess is that in a subgroup of people, there may well be an autoimmune um, element, um, but I don't think it's going to be something that suddenly we realize, oh, we should have been treating fibromyalgia as an autoimmune condition. It may be relevant for some people going forwards, um, but we're quite far away from that. So, um, uh, yeah, it's not it, it isn't something that we're sort of considering in that in that way. Um, I think the link with endometriosis is a little bit stronger. So I think we've got some quite good evidence that in the same way we see overlapping pain conditions, that we do see overlaps with autoimmune conditions. And that includes um, multiple sclerosis, thyroid disease, um, and various auto what we think of as sort of auto inflammatory conditions. But what we don't understand is what the underlying mechanisms are. And again, a bit like some of the data we looked at before, it seems that if you have one of those conditions, you're more likely to develop endometriosis, as well as if you have endometriosis, you're more likely to develop those conditions. And we think that there's probably some genetic um, mechanisms that underlie that. But we know that one of the things that leads to endometriosis is some dysfunction in the immune system clearing the endometrial cells. And therefore, though we wouldn't consider auto endometriosis as an autoimmune condition, it may be that there is some underlying changes in the immune system that makes you predisposed to both of those conditions. Actually, if I might just add, um, it, it is actually similar in, in um, if you flip it around. So for a number of our autoimmune rheumatological conditions, we do see much higher levels of fibromyalgia in those, in those cohorts. Um, but again, we, we don't know why that's happening and why that is so much higher. Um, and so that's that's why, you know, even though we don't think that the uh, majority of people who have fibromyalgia, that it's driven by autoimmune mechanisms, we are seeing in certain groups. So again, so we've mentioned rheumatoid, but any type of inflammatory arthritis. It also does seem to be quite common in people with connective tissue diseases, for example, Sjogren's syndrome um, and SLE. Um, so, so there certainly is something there as an interaction, but as to why that's happening, we don't know as yet.